Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I wanted to welcome all of you that have come and joined us in person and also those of you who've joined us online as well. I'm Alex, I work at Nesta and I am the Director of Discovery, which I always describe as the coolest job title I'm likely to ever have. Uh, my first job, the most important one, is to tell you that there is no fire drill planned. My understanding is that there's a fire exit behind here somewhere if we need it, but uh, I think someone from Prospect will tell us what to do and where to go. That's my hope anyway. So. For those of you uh, that joined us for the last episode in this series, we welcomed Thomasina Myers to come and talk to us about the role of regenerative farming in improving health and combating climate change. Today we have a very different but no less urgent issue to discuss, which is about how we govern the digital realm and the approach we should take to the unprecedented social and economic power of tech monopolies. For those who are new to this series, last year Prospect and Nesta started a unique experiment. So we imagined a minister for the future. This would be a new role, a cabinet level role in the government, where a minister is given the remit to think in the long term, to be ambitious and to examine across the horizon the potential shifts in tech, social trends and geopolitics. So breaking out of the departmental silos that exist in government now and looking across all of them and to the future. We then asked leading experts, innovators, scientists, people in business to pitch ideas to this fictional minister. And we were not disappointed. We got a range of ideas which really demonstrated expertise, radicalism and crucially optimism which in this day and age is quite nice to see. We published this with Prospect uh, as a supplement to the magazine in December. I actually read it whilst I was still working in government. And one of the reasons that I felt ready to get out of government for a bit was because of just how focused on the now and the crisis that we were. So two things that I think are great about this project. One is that it's just, it's a bit of fun. And in the discovery team, we like to have fun with our work. But the other is that I think there's a really important point in there about lifting our heads out of the now. So, why us? Well, Nesta is focused on designing, testing and scaling ideas uh, around the biggest challenges in society. And Prospect uh, has been known to champion bold ideas across the political divide. And this encompasses all of those things. In this event series, we've been exploring the ideas that we collected and tonight we'll be focusing on tech monopolies. So over to Alan. Uh, Alex, and um, this is quite a structured evening, so I'm just going to tell you about the structure. Um, we're going to begin with um, James Plunkett, who's going to come. Uh, so James is the, the director, the, the digital technology leader and author of End State. He's also, there's another great title, Chief Practices Officer. He can tell us what that means when he comes up here at Nesta. Um, and he's going to kick off the evening with uh, a, a little provocation. Um, I will then ask him about the provocation. That, that'll be about 20 minutes. Um, and then we're going to kick James off the panel and he will go and sit down there. And we've got three more people who I will introduce you uh, uh, to uh, uh, later when they, when they come. Um, uh, and then you, it's very important that you are here in the role of minister. You have to uh, judge all these ideas that you're going to uh, be hearing. Uh, and then very excitingly, there's going to be a live poll at the end of the evening in which you get to be flex the, uh, the, the real ministerial power that you have uh, to decide what uh, policies we're going to take forward. Um, so uh, those of you joining online, uh, the instructions are that you put your comments and questions in the box. Um, and a reminder that closed captions can be accessed via the LinkedIn live stream. So that, that's the structure of the evening. And James, please come up on stage, um, talk to us, and then you and I will discuss some of the things you've been talking about. Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start with a bit of problem diagnosis up front. Um, I think we're all kind of here, presumably because we think there is some problem in this, in this space, but um, maybe worth just fleshing out a little. So, um, I mean, people will be aware of the 
fairly stark stats on, stats on market share if you just look at the basic numbers around Google's share of global search, 85 to 90%, depending on how you cut the numbers. Amazon's incredible share of e-commerce, around 40% in the US. Um, Apple's share of global app store spend. So the numbers on the most, in the most basic terms in terms of the market share of these big tech giants are very significant. But I think um, we're starting to appreciate, and economists are starting to appreciate, the problem runs much broader than just big tech, if you like, as we would commonly think of these firms. So if you look overall in the economy, we're seeing uh, an increase in the distribution, in the, in the gap of, in, of productivity between different firms. So even in, in the economy at large, we're seeing rising, as they, as they say, inter-firm gaps in productivity. That's feeding through into inter-firm gaps in wages. So who you work for now matters much more than it did. If you get a job in one of these superstar firms, then your quid's in. If you don't and you're in the kind of ordinary economy, much less so. So the share of profit made by these firms and therefore the share of wages accounted for by these firms is rising. Um, really, really important place-based effects. We won't talk much about this today, I suspect, but these superstar firms are based in superstar places, and so this is playing out geographically. And so uh, that plays into politics, of course, as we're seeing places that feel left behind and some other places that are, that are thriving, cities, in inevitably. Um, and of course, most relevant today, I think, what we're starting to see in the data is that this isn't just sort of successful firms doing well, this is extra normal profits, i.e. This is, this, is, this is market power. So really clear stats on average markups uh, rising over time. Uh, the CMA study of Google and Facebook is quite stunning on the returns they're making on capital. So 40% uh, for Google, 38% for Facebook. So CMA concluding that is not just those firms being successful, that is the result, as they put it, of entrenched market power. So. The CMA themselves saying there is a monopoly problem here. Um, and I think quite telling for me, uh, there's been a decline in what, what are called displacement events. So events when the top firm is knocked off its perch. Um, that is happening less than it used to happen. Maybe we can get into a debate whether that's about to uh, start happening again with AI. But certainly in recent, in recent data, there has been less displacement of top firms. And of course, as you intimated up front, the political economy of all this is, is probably goes without saying that there are profound implications in terms of market power feeding into political power and the sort of the power these firms now have to determine not just the markets that they shape, but also the way in which our public discourse plays out, the caliber of our political discourse, and in the case of social media, most, most profoundly. So, so that's just a, a bit of the problem up front. Maybe we can come on to the solutions I'm talking about. But broadly speaking, I think my overall take is that we had sort of, to be a bit reductive, two broad sort of options in the past, one of which was a more laissez-faire type path to go down where you would arm's length regulate firms, but pretty much leave competition to do its work. It does seem that is no longer viable in the sense that many of the dynamics I've described are systemic, if you like. So they arise from the, the, the nature of digital markets. This isn't just that these firms have kind of um, got too big for their boots. These, these dynamics are arising because of the way in which these markets operate. The other avenue historically has been what you might think of as robust anti-monopoly policy. So, and we can talk a bit more about this. So either break them up um, or regulate these firms. So treat them as natural monopolies and regulate them. And for reasons we can maybe unpack, I think neither of those two options feel particularly attractive in the case of big tech platforms. And that opens up this question of, is there a sort of third path, which I'm kind of framing um, somewhat um, in a kind of somewhat clickbait way as don't break them up, open them up. And we can maybe unpack a bit more what, what, what we mean by that. But for me, certainly, it feels like these two kind of avenues we might have gone down before of either sort of arm's length regulation and basically allowing competition to do its work or more robust either breakups or regulated monopolies. Neither of those seem to me particularly sort of viable strategies for dealing with these big tech monopolies. So that's a bit of, bit of framing up front. That's a really, <coughs> really useful way of kicking us off, James. You, you said don't break them up, open them up. But just can you elaborate on that? Why wouldn't we break up the monopolies um, as Teddy Roosevelt did in the early 20th century? I, mean, I think one thing that is awkward for the kind of advocates of breakups is um, people love these companies. <laughs> so if you look at the um, polling data, and there's quite good data on this in the US and across Europe, you know, people like Google, people like Amazon, they give good customer service, 
And that was not the case for the big industrial monopolies. If you think even now of some of the big monopolies in more traditional industries like um, airlines in the States, like Delta or United, people do not like those monopolies. People do not like Royal Mail. They do not give good customer service to traditional monopolies. So there was a case in those, you know, for, for people saying, you know, break these damn things up. We like Google. They give us a good service and we're quite right to like them. They have innovated. They have made our lives better in quite significant ways. So I think that's, that's one point. Another point, I think, is, um, I mean, do we really want more of these things in our lives? Do we want to have to navigate more social networks? Do we want our friends spread across more social networks? Do we want to have to shop around between search engines and try a search from three different search engines? To that extent, they are natural monopolies from a kind of consumer experience perspective. And I guess the, the last point I'd make is, you know, would they grow back anyway? Because a lot of these dynamics that have led to these monopolies are inherent in the nature of the markets they function in. So, for example, um, when the monopolies are marketplaces, you know, the reason they arise is because if you're eBay, there are lots of sellers on your platform and therefore lots of buyers on your platform and therefore lots of sellers on your platform. And so you get these kind of um, spiral self-amplifying effects. And similarly, data, the more data you have, the better your service, the more data you will generate and the better your service will get. So I'm not convinced even if you were to break them up that they wouldn't just grow back immediately because of those dynamics. Is that what, is that what we're seeing with Twitter at the moment? Yeah, and I have to say, as someone who tried to leave Twitter recently, <laughs> um, because I was, was troubled about the direction of travel, and I kind of went crawling back because, um, you know, it's, it is exactly those dynamics. That is where all the people are, it's where all my followers are. I can't take my followers with me. I can't cross-post to other platforms, and so I'm back on Twitter. Yeah. Sh sh shock announcement. <laughs> that, that probably leads on to the, the, the next point, which is about whether te technological change itself won't create new winners and losers. I, I think you, you, you said you, you don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, but generative AI looks like a significant threat to Google's dominance of the search business. So it, it, it seems to me you can have glimmers of how that might happen. Yeah, and I think it is. It's not implausible, right? And it, it, it remains very unclear how this will play out. I think, um, will Google be displaced by some kind of chat GPT style interface that replaces the notion of search? It does seem possible. I would say Google itself is obviously uh, making huge inroads into AI. So that would be Google's answer to that, to that challenge. Um, so it, you know, it's not, not at all impossible, I would say. I mean, I think even if that were to happen, it still seems likely, although there's some debate around this, that if Google were to be replaced by one of these very powerful models, if you like, um, then that would be the new monopoly. And so it doesn't seem likely that Google would be replaced by you know, multiple, you know, a much more sort of a fragmented market that one monopoly might be replaced by another. But again, those same underlying dynamics of it takes, va takes vast amounts of data to train these models. And so even if Google messed up as Microsoft did in the past and wasn't quick enough to move on this new technology, then we'll have a new Google. Um, does that solve the problem to some extent? Um, but nonetheless, many of those dynamics around the political economy of the thing would, would, would still exist and you would just have a new, a new monopoly displacing the current one. Some, some people think of these, um, some aspects of the digital realm as, as, as parallel to the way that we should could have, should do, treat utilities and bring them under community or national ownership. Is, is that such a wild idea of effectively deprivatizing the internet that it's not worth thinking about? I think, I think it sort of depends what you mean. I think it depends what you mean. So, I mean, I, I, I certainly think, you know, you could make an argument, I think, when you look at the nature of these entities and if you do buy the argument that they're natural monopolies to some significant degree that it you know much like the railway tracks or energy networks or water networks you know, sewage, kind of sewage and water networks that it makes sense to have one of these things one search engine um, that can take you down a route of regulated monopolies i mean I, should, I suppose i would reflect you know we have not found it easy to regulate the monopolies of water and water is a damn sight simpler than say something like AWS or cloud platforms. And even in the case of water networks, 
where you would have thought it was easy to see if sewage was pumping into the rivers and seas and to um, have a regulatory regime around what you can charge, uh, price settlement regimes as we have them around water, for example. Um, similarly, an energy network, so the grid, where we have regulated monopolies, regional monopolies in that case. Again, regulators have found it extremely difficult to manage the kind of difficulty of regulatory capture, to manage the complexity of setting a price, you know, price settlements in those cases. We found companies making huge returns often, I mean, typically outperforming what regulators expected. Um, and bamboo, often bamboo, bamboozling the regulators in terms of um, you know, persuading the regulator they'll invest and then under-investing, releasing sewage, as we've seen, into our seas and rivers in the case of water. And so I know, it doesn't fill me with hope that the idea of, let's say we had a regulated monopoly, a price settlement on, say, AWS or a complex technology like that, you know, do we have the capability really to, to regulate an entity like that? So I, I think in a traditional sense, if you're talking about sort of regulating monopolies or certainly nationalising these industries, I'd, I just think the kind of capability isn't there to run them in that way. Some people think salvation is going to come from being allowed to own our own data and that we can then charge these uh, very large companies to use our data. Um, a runner or not a runner? I'm, I'm sceptical about this. I mean, I, I do this people I have a lot of respect for who go down this route of saying, you know, what these companies are doing essentially is pretending their service is free. And then there's that statement that if the service seems free, then you're the product, right? And so what they're really doing is essentially taking our data for us, liberating us of our data and then selling it on. Um, what they're really selling on, by the way, is the ability to manipulate us using our data to, to other organizations. I, my, my instinct is um, there's a bigger, more profound shift here. And I, I, I personally worry about the concept of ownership as applied to data. I, I don't know, um, people put this, Jenny, Jenny Tennyson puts this very well when she says that data is a relational thing and that most of the data we're talking about here is a relationship between people or entities and can you own, what does it mean to own that kind of thing? What does it mean for me to own my data? And I, I don't know that Ownership isn't a, pro isn't a kind of concept almost that we've carried through from the industrial age when it did make sense to say, I own this, I own this car, I own this item of clothing. And we're trying now to sort of apply that concept of ownership to data. Um, I mean, I argue more in terms of data at least collectively being a public good, um, right? And it seems to me a bit like, you know, if you sort of breathe out air when you're standing in McDonald's, McDonald's doesn't sort of own the air that you've breathed out. It seems to me it's more like that, that kind of thing, that the data that we exhaust as we move around the internet, why should some company own that data? Why shouldn't that be a, be a public good? And there's so much uh, innovation potential and richness and insight and cures for disease and all kinds of incredible innovation sitting in that data that to say it's kind of, it's my data, I want it back, it seems to me it's... The, the shift that we've seen with the, with the rise of the data economy is more profound than that, and we need new ways of thinking about what, what data even is. James, that's a terrific start to the evening. Um, thank you very much. Give James a, hand, a, a round of applause. <laughs> and, and can we have the, the next three um, panellists to come up um, and come and sit here? Sorry, Paul. So um, I'm going to ask each of you to say a little bit um, to get off your uh, to, to expand the, the 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 realm of what we've already heard. Um, but first of all, I'm going to introduce firstly on my left here's Millie Zemeta, who's a data and technology pol uh, policy expert. Uh, she's been head of public policy at the Open Data Institute, where she led engagement with the UK's G7 presidency. Uh, and she's also been a senior policy advisor at the Royal Society. And then we've got Hatton Shah, the chief executive of the British Academy, the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Services, chair of our World in Data and visiting professor at the at King's College London. Uh, next down is Grisa Velez, uh, an associate professor in philosophy at the Institute of Ethics in AI and a fellow at Hartford College, University of Oxford, the author of the highly acclaimed Privacy is Power, and editor of the Oxford Handbook of Digital Ethics. 
And finally, at the end, David Stenebras, an economist director of the leading strategic regulatory advisory firm, Fingleton, who's got a wealth of experience in competition enforcement and consumer protection and works extensively in the tech sector. So Millie, why don't you kick us off? We'll, we'll go um, left, left to right uh, and um, give us some more provocations. Um, well, it's difficult to follow that because I love James's comments. It I, mean, was I, great. Yeah. I love James's writing and it's also really wonderful to hear from him. Um, so I, maybe I thought I'd begin with saying, you know, there's some of what James is suggesting is really radical. It's not just radical to think about opening up these tech monopolies. It's also radical to think about opening up the data, but I think very necessary. Um, so I'll say a bit about the economic features of data. So um, in economics, a, a rival risk good is something where only one agent can be using it or exploiting it at a time. So, for example, this bottle of water, if I'm drinking from it, then probably no one else can. But data is a non-rival risk good. And what that means is multiple actors can be using it at the same time, and it makes no difference. In the same way that, say, lots of people can listen to a Beyonce album, and they can all be enjoying it, and it doesn't mean that they're excluding each other from being able, being able to listen to music. So data is non-rival risk. There are almost no limits on how many different uses it can have at any given time. And when you think of it like that, when you think about the amount of digital data, that's data on the internet, and each kind of data collection can be used multiple times at the same time by multiple users, then you get a real sense of how underutilized these assets are when they're sitting with just one or two companies that are only using them for their products. Then you get a real sense of the kind of the missed opportunities and what we're missing out on. So that's why it's, it's really radical, but also really exciting. Um, but it's not always straightforward to open up data. So for example, yeah, I, I really like the image of this kind of, you know, thinking about data about us as a kind of exhaust, you know, as we travel around the internet. Um, but it would be good to have controls over who gets to use that data and innovate with it. So for example, I might want um, some organizations to be able to innovate with that data. For example, if they want to develop health innovation or you know, innovations that could you know, mitigate climate change. But I might not want that data about me and my kind of activities to be used by other kinds of organizations if I don't particularly like their business models, if I don't particularly like what they stand for, if I don't like their CEO. So it's not clear how we'd manage that if, if that data was made sort of much more openly available to a wider range of organizations. I think we also need to think about this idea of collective rights. So um, originally, our, our current sort of legislation around data, it, it, the GDPR in, in the EU, it, it has its basis as a human right and as a consumer right. And that's very much based on us as individuals. But the power of big data is when we function as a group. You know, one person's data is not that insightful by itself. It's when you have more than one and you can start to compare and benchmark and spot patterns. So thinking about collective rights, but also thinking about collective harms. So something like algorithmic bias, thinking about um, the way racism or sexism can play out in data and AI. That's not on a kind of granular way that affects one person. It affects a particular community or sub-community. So just making sure that we've got those protections and we've got those frameworks in place, maybe before we start opening up the data and maybe exposing particular groups to, to harms or lost benefits. Um, finally, then, maybe something about the thinking about the world in which, if, if we were to open up this data, the kind of the shape of the economy or the market that that would be happening in. So we. The data being available wouldn't necessarily mean there'd be people available to work on the data. It requires some specialist skills. And at the moment, they're mostly employed in big tech. So how are we going to get those people to want to work on other use cases and innovate in different ways? So thinking about the skills pipeline, thinking about incentives, thinking about making sure that talent is distributed across the economy. And sometimes you have the other problem where there's talent but not opportunities because of other kinds of social kind of barriers or biases, such as, again, thinking about uh, discrimination against gender, against race, also against class and regional kind of inequalities. So just because the data is available across the country, say, doesn't mean that the opportunities to work with it might be. So what are we going to do about that? Otherwise, you might get a kind of, um, I think if it's a kind of King Kong versus Godzilla scenario where you've got the giants battling out amongst each other, but you, know, <laughs> you don't necessarily want to live in a world where there are giants battling around you. So that's, that's something to think about. Um, and the reality is that, you know, although we've got these amazing services from Google and the likes, they've developed in an attention economy. So if someone were to try to develop products or services that weren't competing for our attention and didn't operate in that way of being you know, addictive and compulsive, how much traction would they get? Or is it just going to be a race to become more and more addictive and more and more compulsive? So just some, some thoughts there. That's great, Millie. Thank you so much. Hatton. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I think, I mean, there is a sort of germ of good news in all of this. I mean, I agree, Jet James is on to the right sorts of things. Uh, if you'd asked me five years ago, I was a big critic of where competition policy was. And, you know, from the 1980s, it was very focused on this notion of consumer welfare, which essentially meant could a monopoly raise prices. Now, that all breaks down in a world where, as you say, you're exchanging your data for goods, there is no price paid, etc. But it feels to me like in the last five years or so, competition policy has really woken up to this, it's looking at a much wider range of harms. If you read the speech that the CMA chief exec gave sort of at Christmas time, it's really focused on exactly the sorts of issues that James has raised. If you look at the EU Digital Markets Act, which is coming in force in August, the proposed Digital Markets Bill in the UK, interoperability, which is one of the things that James is keen on, that sense of designating platforms, all of these things are there. So actually, we don't need to be thinking about 2040. This is all sort of there in germ form, as it were. So I feel that's great. I do think we shouldn't lose sight of actually the other bits of the toolbox. Uh, and I think sometimes we in this kind of slightly wonky land, gravitate towards certain use cases that we're interested in and ignore others. So I think it's actually worth going through some of them. So Apple, people never think about Apple because we all like Apple, uh, but actually Apple's, Apple's monopoly is on the App Store, but it's a business to business problem. And we never think about those sorts of things in this kind of space. And so it doesn't seem to me that interoperability or opening up is the thing that will help. Uh, that you need to actually regulate the way that a a Apple deals with that one. On Amazon, uh, yes, it may be tending towards a retail monopoly. That's the thing that's debated. Its real issue is it owns Amazon Marketplace, and it's terribly badly behaved in the way that it treats businesses on Amazon Marketplace, because it, if you don't buy advertising from it, then the, it's alleged that uh, they will rank you lower. And again, it's not clear to me that Actually, I think you need different sorts of tools to tackle that, and it's not clear to me that just opening up does that. Google, they bundle their search on mobile. That's a sort of fairly classic uh, competition sort of problem. And then with Facebook, I think this is one where actually spin-off is possible because Insta and WhatsApp were things that they acquired. And it's not clear to me that we would lose the capability of the social network by splitting them off again. So I don't feel like we need to sort of rule, rule ourselves just to one bit of the toolbox. And Twitter, I mean, which we discussed before, is falling over as a monopoly at the moment because everyone's moving to threads, right? I mean, we're literally in that moment. And I mean, front page of the FT, kind of the, the, the Activision Microsoft case at the moment, feels to me, you know, again, I'm not sure that the question of interoperability and opening up is, is really key to that. It's a question of, are we going to form cloud-based markets? Is Microsoft going to have too much? power, etc. Et so I think actually competition policy is going in the right direction and we should continue to, to, to push them in that direction. Fantastic. Carissa. I largely agree with everything said and, and, and with James. Um, and I think the one thing we can agree on as well is that we need to weaken them. It's clear that they're too powerful and it's clear that we are too weak. So we need to weaken them and empower the citizenry. And how do we do that? I agree that it's going to take many tools and not just one. There's no panacea. Um, on the point about whether we like them, do we like them? <laughs> I think we used to like them. Um, but I think we're in an interesting historical moment in which you know the new guys in the block with the hoodies who seem pretty cool now seem kind of dodgy. And um, you know, do, do people enjoy seeing? Um, Elon Musk on their Twitter feeds all the time, even they don't follow, even if they don't follow them. Um, and I think, more importantly, would we like them if we really knew well their practices and um, exactly how they treat our data and what they do with it? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. So I, I think we're at a good moment to challenge these powers. And something that is, is very important is, to, obviously, to think about the data. Opening up some of the data is, I think, a, a good solution. Um, but of course, a lot of that data is personal data. And for all the possible advantages of personal data, there, there are risks, and there are huge risks. And those risks are not evenly distributed. The ones who will bear the most of the, of the burden are women and minorities. We know this, for sure. So, and you might think, well, OK, let's open up data that is non-personal and then keep personal data private. And that sounds very good, but it turns out that it's not that easy to distinguish what is open data from or, or public data 
or non-personal data from what is personal data because we have more and more tools that can infer personal data from you, things that you wouldn't think of as personal data. So there's that challenge. And I think one key piece of the puzzle, um, or so I argue in my book, uh, Privacy is Power, is that we should ban the trade in personal data. As long as personal data is profitable, we will um, collect much more than is needed. And there are other kind of toxic incentives like selling it to the highest bidder, which of course is not the institution that has the best interest at heart. And uh, we were talking, I think James is right to question, like, what does it mean to own data? I think it's completely the wrong way to think about it. Because if I sell my data, my genetic data, to one of these uh, companies that are doing genetic tests, um, I'm not only selling my data, I'm selling the data of my parents and siblings and uh, cousin and, and even very distant kin um, who have, whom I've never met. And of course, they don't have, they didn't give their consent, they don't know about this. So actually, we don't have the moral authority to sell data. Do the 270,000 people who sold their data to Cambridge Analytica for a dollar, did they have the moral authority to sway our elections? No, they didn't. So I think that banning the trade in personal data is going to be a, a major piece of the puzzle. And something to think about is how in the 19th century and in the 18th century, if you wanted to colonize, what you did was you, you went to other countries and you, you conquered lands essentially in different ways and exploited resources. If you want to colonize in the 21st century, what do you do? You turn the analog into digital. That's a new way of coloniz colonizing. And when we think of col colonialism, very often I thought about the British government colonizing India. But actually, it was the East India Company. And we are seeing these incredible, incredibly powerful companies that have more money than governments. And for instance, recently, you know, the UK wants to be a leader in AI, and the government has pledged support of, I think it was 100 million pounds. I'm thinking, that's nothing when you compare it to the kind of money that these companies have. Um, so I think that another important piece of the puzzle will be interoper interoperability and data portability. I think we need to think of different ways to redesign the digital. Um, so for instance, yes, it would be very inconvenient to have different search engines, but maybe we could have one platform in which you could choose the, the, the search engine that you want to work with. And maybe you have different search engines that specialize on different things and you can um, access them through the same platform. So it would be like, instead of you know, only being able to text people who have the same phone company as you, you can text anyone, it doesn't matter what their phone company is. So we need to think in, in, in those kinds of terms. And um, so another really two, two more important points. One is that we have to have much better cybersecurity standards because if we don't, we might get the worst standards possible um, by, by some of the solutions that have been proposed. And our current cybersecurity stan standards are really to cry for. You have companies that have incredibly sensitive data, government data that, are not, that is not encrypted or they have passwords of one, two, three, four. Um, and then finally, we need to be very certain that we don't depend too much on any one company for all sorts of reasons. Of course, they could, they could um, have exploitative practices that we cannot fight, um, but also for, for privacy reasons. And, national security reasons. So the fact that we now just depend on a few companies and that governments depend on them and universities depend on them. And I as a professor cannot assure the privacy of my students because I don't control that platform. I have to use one of these big platforms. I'm obligated. And we have to be very careful in, think in thinking very carefully about whether we want to keep certain things analog and not turn them in, into digital. Not everything should be turned into data. This term of, of data exhaust or collecting personal data is kind of misleading because it suggests like personal data is just like mushrooms in the forest and we go along and we, and we collect them. It doesn't work that way. Um, we create personal data. It's not exhaust. It's the, the system is designed so that every time it intervenes with you or you intervene with it or you stumble across it, it creates data. But we can redesign the digital to be different, and we should cherish the analog, partly to weaken the power of these colonizing companies. Thank you so much, Carissa. And finally, David. 
Uh, I worry that I'm slightly here as the representative of these uh, colonizing uh, companies. <laughs> um, uh, ha having said that, uh, and I'm not, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, the business I do isn't, isn't lobbying. What we try and do is tell the firms what is sensible and they should take seriously in the debates and arguments against them and try and have a more uh, sensible conversation rather than both sides, if you like, drinking their Kool-Aid and shouting at each other, which is what often happens. Um, and to, to that end, I mean, I, I really value James's setting, which is we should be looking for the future and we should be practical about what's possible. And I share a lot of his scepticism about the practicality of, of regulation. It, it's not Captain Picard on the bridge of the enterprise saying, make it so, and everybody makes it so. It's incredibly complicated. Um, and there's a, a very big trade-off when you're trying to intervene to kind of create innovation between control and, and kind of allowing yourself to take a jump into the unknown. And I think the idea of opening up data is very powerful, particularly in the context of generative AI, where it's the specialist data about you, about particular industries, that's probably going to be of the greatest value rather than this kind of general stuff. And if we can do something that opens that up, I think it's going to be very powerful. Now, in Australia, they have something called the Consumer Data Right, which was an attempt, quite a bold attempt, to enable consumers to kind of get their data and share it through quite a mechanised system. And I have to say, there is so much uh, protection and oversight and checks and balances that in order to access that system, you, you couldn't be an entrant. You had to be a big firm to enter. And the amount of friction that consumers saw was so high that it's, it's completely failed and they've basically folded it down. And so if we do think that opening up is going to create this kind of like wonderful plethora of innovation companies, we have to do it in a way that's frictionless and low cost for entry. And that's going to mean taking risks on privacy. So I suppose my argument is that I, I totally agree with this kind of big picture. But if we're going to make it work, we're going to have to take some risks. And some of those risks are with things that at the moment we maybe feel... Uh, very precious to us, but I think the benefit in the future will be far greater. David, as, as you came last, I'll, I'll, I'll pounce on you first. But by the way, if you want to pounce on each other, um, <laughs> don't, don't let me stop Counting. you. Um, can you talk a bit more about um, regulation and the idea that the more regulation you have, the more burdens that you impose on companies? you're really favouring the big companies that are there because the upstarts are not going to be able to meet the, these regulatory burdens because they're very expensive. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll answer that maybe quickly with a quick taxonomy of kinds of regulation. So there's regulation that says, don't do something. Basically, like, don't be an arse. And that's quite easy to conform with as long as you're very clear about what, what being an arse is. And I think quite a lot of the stuff that you mentioned, Hatan, is kind of in that, in that space. And I wouldn't be too nervous about kind of increasing your enforcement in that space. There's a second kind of regulation which is trying to make companies do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And maybe opening up data is part of that. And now I think you need to be quite careful that, that this isn't going to be something that really only large companies can deal with, but you can manage that. There's a third type of regulation, and this is a regulation that seems quite popular at the moment, which is very open-ended, very high levels of discretion and very uncertain what it's going to mean. And the only firms that can really engage with that are either highly litigious kind of complainants whose business model almost is gaming the regulation, or really big incumbents who can deal with it. And we're moving towards that in the UK, and I think it could be very damaging. It's just going to create a whole load of rent seeking. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a rent seeker, and it's, 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 not, a, it's not, a great, not great for the economy. But if you say to a company, uh, if, if you do the following things uh, and the following bad things uh, for long enough, we're going to start finding you tens of billions of dollars or jail you. And the solution to that is to hire hundreds of thousands of people to do this. That, that really stops anybody else coming to that market, doesn't it? it, it yeah, it, it, it can do. I think most of the regulations that we have that are kind of preventative regulations don't force you to do that. I think it's the regulations that we might have that say you must start doing things. I mean, 
a good example is in financial services, where we have a new regulation that financial services firms have to make sure that customers get a good deal. But it's not defined what a good deal is. And that's a massive barrier to entry to small firms who like, just don't even know how to engage with this. Chris, you said we might like some of these companies a little less than if we knew more about them. Can you, can you unpack that a bit? Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of people are not very happy with Twitter at the moment. We used to like it, um, some of us. Um, with Facebook, of course, first there was the great optimism of, wow, this is a platform you can connect with your old friends and um, all kinds of connection that you wouldn't have otherwise. But then it turned sour pretty quickly uh, when we learned how, how they dealt with their data. And then, of course, Cambridge Analytica showed that this, um, this was common and they were trading with our data and, and categorizing us in incredibly sensitive categories and trying to uh, change our emotions and all kinds of uh, practices that were unacceptable. Um, Google, similarly, it looked like an incredible idea. And then you realize, well, yeah, but they trade in personal data. And you know, the, the founders of the company had vowed that a search engine that depends on ads is never going to be loyal to their users. And yet they ended up doing that because they couldn't come up with a different way of funding it. And you know, Apple, I think, is maybe the uh, better liked company. But of course, even though they have done some good things and they, and they are superior in design in many ways, they have also come up with a lot of surveillance equipment. And no matter how much you encrypt data, a camera is a surveillance <laughs> equipment nonetheless. And not only a camera, but of course, for instance, when we go around the streets, uh, if you have your Bluetooth on, there are all kinds of companies that can use that information to know things about you, uh, like where you've been before and what, what other networks you've connected to. And, and that Apple designed that. Um, and then Amazon, again, at the, at the beginning, it was all kind of rosy. Um, but now it's more and more the case that there's the junkification of Amazon. It's, it's harder and harder to know what, what, what's a good product. And of course, they're um, upping their prices in some ways and you know, the expectation of workers and all kinds of problems. And, and these companies are not paying taxes. And so do we like them when we see the big picture and the kind of effects that it has already had in, had in society, but it will have the normalization of surveillance? Um, and I think that it's not a coincidence that we're seeing authoritarian tendencies as big tech rises. So not only we ha do we have less number of countries that are democratic since um, the past four or five years, um, but also the quality of democracy in democratic countries is being eroded. And I don't think this is a coincidence. Surveillance tools are made to control, and control leads to a loss of freedom. And we're putting it everywhere. Hetton, I mean, you, you just picking up on where Chris had sort of ran through these companies. You, you had your own tick list of companies. You talked about the, the Apple, um, the Apple Store monopoly, and, and the Amazon bad behavior on marketplace. But, but I, I wasn't quite clear what the solution to those. I mean, let's take those two as examples. What, what, what's your solution for those? Two? Yeah, well, I think with um, th th this is moving back to the sort of regulation aspect. That actually, in this case, probably with Apple, you have to say, well, it seems like you're overcharging in this space. You, you, you've got to allow. Uh, you know, take take a lower profit share, as it were, uh, with marketplace. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, you the, you probably threaten them with splitting them off, but I suspect in the end that you wouldn't do that. But actually, all of these bad practices, which are relating your main product with your marketplace, do need to kind of have a wall between them, as it were. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was um, just this notion of how we open up the data. Uh, there's a very interesting example in the UK which I was involved in helping to enact, which is not very well known, which is that in the Digital Economy Act, which was about sort of seven or eight years ago, we got a provision in which now allows the Office for National Statistics access to any private sector data set for statistical purposes. This is not known really, and frankly, they're not very keen on it being <laughs> known. Uh, but here we have the premier public service department in data, which is very well respected in the UK, having access to private sector data. So they can now try and track inflation, for example, using scanner data. Now, in practice, what they're doing is they've not used that to 
swiped the data. They've gone and sort of spoken softly to the companies and said it'd be very nice if you let us use this data. And of course, having that in your back pocket helps. Uh, but it does feel to me that that's a really nice example of where we've already enacted this and we should you know, use that and build upon it. Millie, is there anything that you want to respond to, to from anything you've heard on the platform? If not, I've got something that... Just thinking back to the kind of the remit of Minister for the Future, it's really hard because, you know, we're, we're trying to do the kind of the big picture strategic thinking, but also part of what can make a vision attractive is that it can be operationalised and it can be implemented. And we're moving between, moving between the two. But I think it's also a good thing that we can move between the two. If there was nothing that could be acted upon, then it'd just be a, a fantasy and a dream. So I, I quite like it that, we're, you know, that we're, we're, we're thinking about what would that look like in practice and identifying the challenges, but also identifying ways that it could be done, maybe. What did you think of Chris's idea of banning the trade in personal data? I think a lot of these are kind of unknowns and that we won't know what impacts it will have. And I mean, we're talking about the UK, but if one country bans the trade and other countries don't, it's only when we see the comparison that we'll know what was effective and what wasn't. And I think that a government would need to feel that it had a strong kind of mandate from its, its population to, to do that. So I think that it's, but with, with all of these aspects of the digital economy, it, it can sometimes feel like, you know, where it's, someone's waiting for someone else to make the first move. And if it works, then the speed at which developments can be implemented and these others will follow suit. So I think it would need a really, um, really, either a really strong mandate or um, a really strong vision such that we could ride out some of the maybe short term impacts to, to yeah. get there. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be, massively concerned about banning the trade in personal data because what it would do is it would mean that very large firms who had control of the data could use it internally but if you're a smaller firm if you're an entrant if you're separate from them you wouldn't have access to it so i think banning i can understand why you might want to do it but i think the effect would be just a massively double down on this kind of persistency and size of the kind of firms that we engage with so i think it might have some upsides but it'd be antithetical to the, the framing of the discussion that we've had here. But of course, that would be only one thing that you would do, right? You would do a lot of other things to make sure that those firms are not as powerful as they are. Like, for instance, opening up data that is not personal and forbidding, for instance, certain kind of inferences that might make non-personal data into personal data. So, um, and you know, of course, we've, we've, we're all very impressed with what the bulk of data can do. We've all tried ChatGPT, it's very impressive in some ways, very unimpressive in others as well. Um, but now we're reaching a point in which it's becoming quite clear that throwing more data at a problem doesn't make it any better. There's a limit to how much data you can throw at an AI. And I think what we'll see in the future is AI that uses a lot less data. And that's going to be interesting and good for all kinds of reasons. Um, but when we think about personal data as a kind of toxic asset, so a good analogy is asbestos. So asbestos is a mineral that is very cheap, it's very easy to mine, and it's incredibly helpful because it's durable, it doesn't catch fire easily, so we put it everywhere. We put it in our roof, in our ceilings, um, plumbing, um, tiles, you name it. And it turns out that it's incredibly toxic as well, and hundreds of thousands of people die from cancer uh, from exposure to asbestos every year. And personal data is similar. Yes, it's cheap to mine, yes, it can be helpful, um, but it's also incredibly toxic, and we're seeing how Equality of, of opportunity is eroding because you and I are not be tre being treated as equals anymore. We are being treated on the basis of our data. So depending on what you've searched for, um, what kind of laptop you own, where are you searching from, you will see other opportunities that I won't see. If you're a man, you will see ads for higher paying jobs than I will. And we're seeing how it's exposing citizens to public humiliation, to extortion, to discrimination. And it's a national security threat. Personal data has been used in the past for the purposes of genocide. It has been used for the purposes of blackmailing uh, public officials, the military. It's, a hu it's, it's reckless the way we are amassing that kind of um, personal data. But I wouldn't blame the data. I mean, the, these practices have always existed pre-data. Uh, and, you know, these are things that we do. And the genie is out of the box. So for the, qu the question for me is, how do we, for me, the, 
how do we use the new powerful technologies that we have in an intentional way to create the good society that we want? How do we ensure that this is not a dystopia which is based on inequality, surveillance, and uh, all, you know, automation everywhere, low levels of quality work, etc.? How do we ensure that the, the profits are well spread, that there's generous prosperity, we win back time, we have good quality work? And I feel that those pathways are all open to us, as it were, um, but we have to shape it. So I'm going to be a very strict timekeeper, uh, and this is the time that we invite you back onto the platform. Uh, and uh, you would now take your responsibilities as the minister very seriously. Uh, and um, we expect some very challenging questions. Now, I'm hoping that we've got some questions online that we might be able to kick off with. One minute. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a few great questions coming in from online. So the first one is, uh, what kind of incentives or benefits would governments have to break up monopolies? Just, just repeat it. What, what kind of incentives? What do kind of incentives or benefits would governments have for breaking up tech monopolies? Somebody jump in. I mean, one one thing I'd say on this is, I think we have to be really clear about what our concerns are and what the causes of the concerns are. And in a lot of situations, the cause of a concern is not going to be the monopoly power. And so I'll give an example of, of Facebook. I'm not saying the monopoly power isn't a concern. Um, a lot of people are very angry with Facebook, feel like it's very addictive, uh, creates lots of ha uh, harm in society. But because for a while it was basically the only game in town, governments could liaise with it directly and it could try and change what it did. If you had like four Facebooks competing with themselves for your attention, the, 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 the way that market's going to work is they're just going to work really hard to, to compete with you for your attention. And that is exactly what we're concerned about. So in some situations, I'm, I'm very unconvinced that the answer to the problem is, is more competition. It's going to be something else. So I, I think there can be quite a large downside to try and break them up in that sense. Should we alternate questions in the room with questions online? Yeah, hand here, if somebody can get a microphone over there. <laughs> okay, the mic is working. Um, this has been so interesting, thank you so much. It feels a bit like all the kind of tech stuff in the world has happened way before humans have even decided what we want from it. Mm -hmm. It feels like there should be some kind of like Ten Commandments judging, like um, governing what we do want and what we don't want from big tech things, chat, GPT, etc. So I'm just wondering from anyone in the panel, if there was one thing that you could say, please can we have this, um, please can we not have this, um, what would it be? In, in terms of the future or in terms of the present? Yeah, in the future, like if we were creating a Ten Commandments yeah. for tech companies to follow. In, in, in terms of things like AI, for instance. Mm. Like, for yeah. example, ChatGPT, like, yeah. please don't. I've got not. a very specific one. It's really, really specific, which is I don't want AI powered drones. I, I know it sounds really bizarre, but, like, I mean, that is the one kind of really sort of very specific thing that really keeps me up at night, the kind of from a security perspective. Because once you've got drones flying, you know, non state actors and state actors having weapons which are easy to kind of control and can fly all sorts of places, that, that really does worry me. So I think I, I say I don't want surveillance. Um, not, no surprise there. I, I don't think the genie is out of the bottle. Um, I think we can change things, and I think that the data is part of the problem. So it's it's like saying like, well, we should all be able to leave our, our houses open, and the problem is that you know people shouldn't go in. Well, yeah, but that's kind of naive. Like eventually, I mean, somebody might cook a, uh, bake a cake for you and, and leave it at your house, but you know, eventually somebody's going to abuse that power. And I would also say uh, I want technology to enhance people's autonomy. And there's a really interesting link between medical ethics and digital ethics. So before medical ethics came around, um, the duty of the patient, if you read like medical ethics codes from 1890, the duty of the patient was to follow the advice of the doctor without asking questions. So if the doctor says, yeah, take this pill, you just take it and shut up. And sometimes you wouldn't even get a diagnosis. And what medical ethics did is like, no, wait a minute, we have autonomy and the patient has a right to be well informed and to decide for themselves because those decisions are not only medical, they're value laden. 
And I think we need to see the same thing in digital ethics. It's like, don't give me what you think I want or what you want me to want. Um, you know, get, give me the chance to say what kind of life I want. And, and in virtue of that, choose the technology and design the technology. Anybody else want to come up with one of the Ten Commandments here? Yeah, yeah, the, the, one, end? the one I throw in, I, I quite like the analogy with um, the, the digital commons, the concept of the digital commons as a kind of, um, compared to say a national park or um, that, that kind of mental model. And I, I, I like the idea of a right to roam, so a kind of, um, yeah, a, a, a right to kind of move freely between these spaces and, for example, take your data with you or talk to a friend who's in another space. Because it, it does seem to me that, um, this is quite a profound sort of wrong path we've gone down. You gave the example earlier of text or email where, you, of course, you can text a friend who's on a different network because it's an interoperable technology. And we find it hard now to imagine, you know, what would it even mean for me to be able to tweet a friend who's in Facebook because we're so far down this path of kind of proprietary closed ecosystems that it's hard to even think what they would have been like. But I do think if you took boldly, if you took seriously this idea of you should be able to move freely across these ecosystems and follow that through, it, it, that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a big deal in changing how this economy op operates. David? Uh, oh, okay. I mean, just as an aside on that, I mean, the, the, the problem is that text basically hasn't changed the technology since we were voting for people in Big Brother 1. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same technology, <laughs> and that's why you can do it. Uh, the, the thing that I would not, and, and related to that, I mean, the thing that I think we mustn't lose sight on is just the transformative power of growth. Mm -hmm. And that if, if we're doing things that are going to be seriously impeding the opportunity for, for, for growth, that, that's a massive cost. You know, the only way we're going to deal with the climate crisis is, is growing our way out of it. Just the political economy is, I can see someone massively disagreeing with me over there. Uh, the political economy of the world is it's going to be almost impossible to solve it without that. And digital goods are surprisingly low carbon for the for the utility that they give. So I think we mustn't lose sight of the benefit of growth. Mm -hmm. Millie, do you have a, a, t a commandment? Yeah, I think we have to start with the kind of society we want and then work out the role of the technology in that. I think the technology is so fascinating and dazzling that we're kind of assuming that's the given, then we work out where to put it. I think the other way around, start with what we want the world to look like and then work out what technology is useful for that. I think one thing I am concerned about is, is um, and, and James mentioned it in his, in his provocation, the kind of the role of this technology perhaps in amplifying inequalities. And I think that the digital economy, if it's seen as something that kind of like can massively increase inequalities, increase um, kind of like differences in, in life opportunities and so on, I think it's not going to be trusted. And I think it's going to put more pressure on the kind of social tensions we already have. So it's really important to me that the digital economy is seen as equitable and sustainable to be trusted and that, that it will have a role in growth and it will all kind of like tr trust it more. But I think that managing inequalities and kind of being seen to be contributing to social good in the world is going to be really important. Have we got another question online? Then we've got a hand at the back. Yeah, of course. So I think we're kind of reflecting on whether this is an issue in other industries and whether there are any other um, examples of monopolies uh, that we could learn from to kind of think about regulating these tech giants. So someone's asked, you know, are there news agencies, mass media? Are there any other examples of monopolies we can compare to today's tech giants? And how are these monopolies regulated? And can we learn any lessons from that? So, I mean, some of it is historical, right? It's the standard oil, the railways, et cetera. And, of course, that's where original competition law came from. But I think the whole point, what this debate is showing is that the digital monopolies or powers are different. And that's why I think you need this kind of range of tools that you've been talking about as well. So, yes, the sort of traditional breakup, et cetera, is there. Regulation is there. But actually, there's a whole set of other things which, uh, which we do need new tools for. I mean, and it will continue to evolve. So things like fake reviews, right, just didn't exist as a thing 20 years ago. Now it's a thing. So again, uh, the Competition Markets Authority is trying to give itself new powers, which mean it can sort of stamp on these things as they emerge. And that will mean more fleet of foot regulators. But it, it is a problem because, as you say, you then look at regulators today, and you look at off what, and you look at off chairman and so on, and then you kind of, you know. <laughs> so. It, yeah, we'll, we're, we're always continuously going to be chasing our tail. And have you tried hiring a data science recent, scientist recently? You know, it's an expensive thing to get the talent in. Question at the back. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, I really appreciated the uh, the point about imagining the world that we want, and also James's point about digital commons. I think both of those policy questions and uh, uh, questions about public goods actually bring up the, the, the question of, okay, then who builds it, who funds it? And so for the minister of the future, I would ask, is there a public good version, is there a public interest technology version of what we're talking about? There were a lot of feature ideas that came across the panel, but I think the idea of telling tech companies that they have to build it that way is a bit more difficult than perhaps imagining what a public interest version could be. I really agree with that, and I think, I mean, I just think we're, we're missing institutions all over the place, right? There's just a kind of, I often think of it as um, when you remove furniture from a room and you can sort of see where the sofa was, <laughs> where there's, just, there's all these kind of spaces that are just missing institutions, that in 20 years we will have institutions and we struggle now to imagine what they might be because they won't be state necessarily, they won't be private. Um, and I think, for example, again, in, that, in the context of, um, you know, land and how we steward land. You think of an institution like the National Trust, which is a curious institution. It's sort of a charity. I think it formally is a charity, but it's sort of more than that. Um, you know, do we need institutions that steward our data and that hold data and are trusted to hold our data and to kind of govern access to the data in our collective interest as a public good? And what, what kind of status would those institutions have? What is it? What would it take to seed those institutions as the state? I mean, they're not going to come into being unless the state plays some role in architecting them and kind of statutes or something. But um, I just agree. There's a kind of, um, we struggle, I think, to imagine what they are, but it's just so clear they're missing. You can just sort of see the spaces of institutions that are needed and don't, don't currently exist. I see you nodding very passionately, Millie. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that the... Um, that's, that's where it's really important to have, you know, this, I like, again, this provocation of Minister for the Future, to have a vision and, and for anyone sort of enacting it to know that they've got a mandate for it. And I think that also requires us to kind of maybe, um, maybe to have a higher, high level of literacy about what the technology can and can't do so that we can all play a role in, in shaping that vision. Um, I, I think that's it, you know, it's that, um, it, it's, it's going to cause disruption and conflict trying to impose anything or trying to develop anything. And as you say, James, it will take time. So I think a lot will depend on the strength of the vision and the sense of confidence that this, is, this has got public support. There's a hand right at the back. Probably really awkward to get the microphone <laughs> to, but, but I'm sure it'll be worth the effort. <laughs> no pressure. Um, in terms of designing the internet, you could argue that the Clinton bill of the late 90s, when it classified uh, the platform as not being responsible for the content, that de facto defined it in a way that really wasn't appropriate. Uh, it has editorial control, as we see ongoingly and most recently with Elon Musk. And would a simple radical way to reframe it to say you're, you're not a platform? Um, James, I can see you nodding. Section 230 question. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's certainly, yeah, it's radical. I mean, declare them as publishers, essentially, right, and hold them to account for the, the, the what, what's published. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't love, I don't love it when we reach for a kind of pre-existing category and try to classify these, what for me are new things. It feels to me similar to when we did with Uber. We said these are employees. Or, that's what people tried to say as a way of, finding our way through how do we give rights to people who work for Uber and I don't know, my instinct is they're not employees. They're, it's not employment as a relationship. It's, you might be reaching for that as a tool because it's the only available tool, but it's not the right one and we should find new tools that are invented for these very new things. But I, I don't know, that's just my gut instinct. I always worry when we sort of reach for the closest available fitting tool that we've got in our current toolkit and try to apply that better than nothing maybe, but, but much better would be to say, well, what actually are these things and what are the responsibilities of platforms as opposed to pretending they're publishers, but that's a personal instinct. 
Well, no, just online. Maybe. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay. yeah can, can jump in. I'm just thinking maybe a bit of failure is a good thing because it's by showing that the existing toolkit doesn't work, by trying to apply it, which is kind of efficient, you know, yeah. and saying, well, look, actually, it's not working, things are still falling between the gaps, it's still sort of falling short. Then you get the kind of mandate to say, actually, then let's scrap this and do something new. So maybe a bit of failure, as long as it's sort of bound in time and space very tightly. <laughs> yeah, next online question. Yeah, for the kind of academics on the panel, uh, we've got a question about what's the role of like academic research in supporting these arguments and where is that going to go? And yeah, do you guys think that that has potential? Well, uh, obviously I'm biased. <laughs> 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 but I think academic research is incredibly important, uh, among other things, because it's one of the few jobs in democracy that has some kind of independence, along with journalists and judges and a few more. Um, we are supposed to be at least um, the kind of defenders of truth and truth seekers. And one of the things I worry about a lot is that I know too many researchers working in this field who are directly or not so directly but not so indirectly funded by big tech. And, and that's a huge worry. So I think that we should uh, do our utmost effort to protect academia and in particular to protect it from, from exterior influence like, like that of big, big tech. Yeah, and can I add, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think this is where a multidisciplinary approach is really critical. So, um, so quite, I mean, some of the statements that have been made about AI being an existential threat have come from computer scientists who, you know, do, um, and they're putting forward governance solutions. They're not experts on governance. So actually, how do you bring social scientists, humanities, arts people together uh, to help us sort of look, look at these problems in the round, I think is really important. And then on your point about funding, one of the things I have been involved in is setting up the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is based at the Nuffield Foundation. And you know, one of my core objectives with that was something that had no big tech money in it at all. There are very few institutions which are kind of at that space of research and civil society, which are uncontaminated, as it were. And it's really important we have more, not just more academia, but more civil society in this space as well. Uh, Alex, you, you should certainly have a try to honor a, a, a vote. So, I've, got, uh, I've got one more online if you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. What is the potential for global agreements on how these companies are treated in terms of regulation and tax, as opposed to trying to do that at this kind of movement at a national level? I think that's super important. It's not easy, but it's super important. Um, and in a way, it's an advantage because the United States had to first regulate its big companies alone. But now we have lots of countries who have a stake at it and who want to regulate big tech. So we have countries in Europe, in UK, um, Japan, New Zealand, uh, Latin America, Canada, the United States. So I think it's, it's, a great, it's, a, it's a golden opportunity to have a new alliance of democratic countries and a new Bretton Woods and a new uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights or something like that that pertains to AI, cybersecurity, and privacy. Um, not easy, but we've done it before and it can be done. Alex, you've got a question? No. So just, just on that, if yeah. I may, I think the African Union last year, they published a draft data governance framework mm -hmm. and they're recognizing the risks of kind of a second generation of colonization. They're trying to make sure that the that kind of foreign, foreign interests in African data is, is restricted in that way. So they can build their infrastructure from the ground up themselves. Alex. So that was going to be my question. As the minister, I was thinking through as a minister what are the questions I'd ask and one of them would be to what extent can I do this alone versus should I actually just be focused on getting my counterparts around the table uh, internationally. But the other question I would ask as a minister is uh, how do I build, uh, how do I make this appealing? What's the public sell? Hmm. I mean, I was very attracted by your comment really about the importance of, of trust. Um, and I, I think a little bit, a colleague was talking about the, the lack of trust in GM food. Theoretically, uh, if people trusted GM food more, I mean, let's assume that it's okay. I don't know if it's okay. If it was okay and people had trusted it more, it could have made a very big positive effect to, for the whole world. But there's a lack of trust. I still don't trust it because I don't know anything about it really. And so is, is there a role for creating that trust? But, but, there, but there's a trade-off, which is the more that we do to try and put that trust in place, the more we're going to slow things down. I think it's going to be quite hard to find the optimal place on that. 
there's been a very persistent hand there, so you, your persistence Th is all. Th thanks very much. Um, it, it seems like the reasons why things, why approaches wouldn't work fall into different categories. So, so you don't break up the monopolies because network effects mean they work better as monopolies. <coughs> you can't just move your data around because it's a bit like blockchain for everything. It'll all work as long as we make every single thing infinitely more complicated. Um, and the third one is, you know, uh, actually sort of uh, uh, network type regulation doesn't work because governments aren't very good. And that seems like a very different category from the other two. It doesn't seem like it can't be done. It seems like we don't think it will be done. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd put the challenge that I think the, the big problem for regulation, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm cheered by what Heaven says about them having got out of their old boxes and, and become you know, more flexible, but the form of power that is accumulated by continually more and more data and more and more compute is the power to create new systems. And we haven't even defined that legally. And, and that's the power that, that's continually getting bigger. And we are, we're used to wealth continually getting bigger or market share getting bigger. We haven't even defined that one. Mm. Anyone want to jump in on that? I do think that, as, as you say, the, the competition authorities are starting to think about these scale effects or, uh, and what they're trading off, which we haven't talked a lot about today, is actually the welfare that we get from using some of these things. I mean, it's, we've been quite negative, but that's, there is a reason why we use some of these services. Okay, some of them are addictive, but not all of them. And as I say, some of the ones we haven't really talked about, I download something from the Apple Store to listen to, I play a video game, etc. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of people who enjoy this stuff, as it were, and it's about how, you know, how do you optimally reg regulate these things? But I, I do think what's come out today is the sort of data piece, which I think is really important. And then when you layer on the AI piece, <coughs> key question for me is how far will AI end up in the hands of some small number of companies, or actually will this become a sort of distributed technology in some way? And funnily enough, I don't say this very often, the UK government's AI white paper is actually pretty good, uh, better than the EU AI Act, which was all about, you know, is it a high risk or low risk technology, whereas we know that it's actually how the technology is used, which is the problem. The problem again is, will the regulators have any extra capacity to apply the principles? Probably not. I think we have, can yeah, I have a go at responding yeah. to that question, but also, Alex, to yours? So I'm a big fan of Stuart Hall, and he used to quote Gramsci a lot, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So you have to confront the problem with this kind of analytical pessimism, but then have something that pushes you through and to try anyway. And one thing I've noticed, every time there's one of these kind of like catastrophes or scandals around data, digital tech, and AI, it gets people talking about it. It gets people thinking about their rights or their expectations, mm -hmm. and also raises the level of public literacy. And I think there's something there about, well, all of these problems are also opportunities. To. And I remember once, the, I think the president of Estonia was in, in London and she was at a seminar and someone asked the question about how did Estonia become, you know, such a kind of digital forward country and she said, the country, the population felt they had nothing to lose. They compared themselves to their neighbours and felt that they were economically disadvantaged and that this was something that they could go with if it gave them a chance to catch up with their peers and so on. So I think it's a lot about each country will have its own narrative based on its culture, based on its sense of identity as a country, as a community. So you've got to work with that in, in your storytelling, like how does this country conceive of itself? How does this population conceive of itself domestically and internationally? And then when, you, when these crises happen, when these breaches of trust, when these kind of scandals and kind of, you know, failures happen, then you use them to kind of either strengthen that sense of national identity and push it forward in ways that we can get behind. Okay, final question here. Yes, you, yeah. Um, hello, thank you um, everyone for the, um, you know, uh, for your speeches, it was very interesting. <coughs> so I was wondering, while you were saying that, you know, we don't have just one tool, and then it was just, um, James said a um, few moments ago, it was about some of the tools that we are applying, they are not quite there yet. So I'm thinking, when we are trying to assess a tech monopoly, and we are looking into a market definition that was written ages ago, that is a bit, you know, old, and it can't quite fit into that box, and then we need to use an abuse of dominance, theory that, again, it was not made for an international market. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution of changing it? You know, do, we new, do we need new competition rules so they are stronger and I can compete with this? So do we need to tweak them? Or can we use some other tools that can be a bit more powerful because the burden of proof is lower, such as uh, litigation? So the market for litigation in, in UK and Europe is not that mature yet because mm -hmm. we don't really have clear rules. 
So it could be a solution to try to get that market to the point where it's in the US. Because you know, in the US, I did one case against Apple for that developing, you know, like their discrimination of developers and the fact that they are charging 30% developers uh, when they're selling their, um, their apps. And you know, um, Samsung you know, and Google on the same platform, they don't charge 30%. So you wonder, you know, if they have the monopoly in, in, you know, in accessing that while they're charging 30%. But it's very difficult to make the case that that price is excessive. Again, because my tools are proving, you know, I mean, proving what the market is and then proving that they have an abuse and dominance. Or I did four cases against Amazon on, you know, um, MFN clauses and the fact that they were also favoriting, you know, their own, um, their own platform. So what you were saying that if you threaten them by splitting the marketplace and I mean, the sellers, that maybe that could, you know, could work. Um, so I was wondering if that could be, you know, um, a solution better, you know, mm. th that could work better than just competition policy. Mm. I have a slightly geeky answer to this. Um, so where you have a really clear law, private litigation can like totally supercharge the effectiveness in which it's applied. Um, if the law is unclear, then private litigation is essentially privatising decisions that should be made for public purposes based on assessments of, of profitability of trying to make a particular case. And I think that's really, really damaging. And I think what we've heard today is that there's still a lot of debate, even within a relatively aligned panel, actually, compared to some that I've <laughs> been on, uh, there's still very substantial disagreement. So I'd be incredibly nervous about relying on private litigation to try and enforce the kind of uh, you know, bleeding edge change that we're talking about here. But I would bring popcorn to the copyright holders who are suing all the large language models, because <laughs> I think they're going to win, and I think that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, now, Minister, it's time for you to choose. Uh, and we're going to use the technology on the screens. Can you see it? Yes, yeah, there we go. So the, there is a QR code. Um, and if you've got a mobile phone, <laughs> we've not got a mobile phone. Uh, we're not collecting any data on this. On this. <laughs> um, point your QR phones to the screen, and that will give you a poll. If you're online, check the comments section of YouTube and LinkedIn to access the link to the poll. <laughs> it's exploded your phone, has it? Oh, you've turned it on. Oh, well, you've got you've got you've got um, a couple of minutes. Um, so you'll see the poll options are, this should be on the screen in front of you. Number one is open up the tech giants. That is codify the idea of platform in law, require enter interoperability of the platforms and require new civic responsibilities of platforms. We've been talking quite a lot about that this evening. Number two is go bold, break up big tech or deprivatize the internet. <laughs> Uh, and number three is things aren't so bad. We have the access to the technological capabilities our parents could only have dreamt of. So why change? Votes one, two, and three. And if you look at the screens. Can you guys see him? Yeah. Hmm? Can you see him? Um, not really, almost. I, but, uh, yeah, I can see a big blue line opening up. <laughs> has everyone voted? Anybody not yet? Has it, anybody not yet started up their phone? I mean, it's <laughs> we need a fourth option of uh, things aren't so bad, but they could be much better. <laughs> Don't complicate the evening at this time. <laughs> we want to get at the drink. Okay, the minister has voted, um, and the votes are in. I can't actually read the percentage. Is that in our sixty-nine? Shout out that eight. Is it eight? Eight. Sixty-eight. Uh, 68, 68 now. How many? Sixty-nine for open up. Sixty-nine. Okay, sixty. The vote is in. The scores on the doors. Uh, open up text. Giants gets sixty-nine. Go bold gets seventeen. Seventeen. Fourteen. Fourteen. Oh, yeah. 17. It's, it's, it's dropped right. from the bottom, gold it's bowl. Changed. And things aren't so bad. 
Yeah. Oh, I see. They, they've changed, right. Um, so there you are. Thank you, Minister. That, that's a very decisive uh, reaction. Um, can I thank the speakers for being so entertaining and provocative and, and um, nobody came to punches. That, that's <laughs> great, as it's um, sounding by uh, some, some of the other panels. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, if you're online, thank you for joining us online. Uh, if you're here and if you have a moment, um, please fill in the event feedback survey, which is on screen now. Uh, and those online can find the link in the comments box. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and just to tell you about the next event, which is on the 21st of September, and it's about healthcare in a modern age and why we need a nat national health bank with Dame Sally Davis, so put in your diaries and please come along to that. Sign up to both Nesta and Prospect newsletters to keep up to date uh, with future events. Um, you won't be amazed that my final injunction is to subscribe to Prospect. Um, Easy as we speak now, the, the, uh, the elves are mining away, um, putting the, the final uh, finishing touches to the edition that will be on sale next Wednesday. Uh, and please come and join us for a drink upstairs. But a big round of applause for the panel.